And just bow your hearts with me for this brief prayer. Dear God, hold us this morning. Be and stay with us. Amen. A favorite book of mine by Alice Walker is a collection of essays that challenges us towards the work of liberation and at the same time acts as a healing salve to the reader, filling in all those little cracks, those tiny fissures in the soul with hope. Still, Walker makes it plain, the work is ours to do and uses the words of June Jordan to title the collection, We Are the Ones We've Been Waiting For. As I'm just back from a pilgrimage to Alabama and Brian Stevens's Equal Justice Initiative, I'm flipping through that book again. Don't be fooled by priest as spiritual giant. We're out here right alongside you trying to figure out a way forward, working out our faith with fear and trembling. I'm reading it again to set my imagination free. We visited the Legacy Museum, taking in the truth of the 400-year history of struggle from slavery to mass incarceration and mourned together at the National Memorial for Justice and Peace a site dedicated to the victims of lynching. Our journey included time spent with oral historians in Selma like jo Joanne Bland, who shared their memories of the early days of the fight for voter and civil rights. They, these at the time children, marched with Dr. King and others over the Edmund Pettus Bridge. They lived through what would become Bloody Sunday. The Church of the Heavenly Rest, one of my sponsoring parishes, took this pilgrimage as a parish back in 2019. With so many different points of entry into this story, into this history, I wondered how the community would care for each other. Sadly, in 2024, I had the same questions. Since that trip, we've experienced a global pandemic, and equally important, we fumbled our way through a time of racial reckoning. Since then, we witnessed a coup at the Capitol, our nation rising against itself. It's been pretty hard. The world, as we keep saying, feels like it's on fire. How would we take care of each other on a journey like this? Among our group were those like me, who are descendants of slaves those with ties to the KKK, and those who struggled to find a connection to the history and horror shared. How would we, how could we do this work? As I stand before you today, I'm a ball of feelings and memories. It's as if a container or vessel of emotions has erupted and I can no longer ignore the overflow. I'm unmoored, yet still in the grip of so much pain and confusion. This pilgrimage has opened my eyes and heart to questions about identity and place. I am slowly remembering. My parents came to New York City from Alabama and South Carolina at the ages of 18 and 14, respectively. My mom and a few friends got live-in jobs cleaning apartments and never looked back. My father refused to work for anyone. He found empowerment in the Muslim faith. He changed his name and got a job as a taxi driver before beginning his business as a manufacturer of stuffed toys. This was the early 60s. And even a little bit before that, the dawn of the civil rights movement. Their time in New York City helped them escape what they believed the full grip of Jim Crow. They came, found love, or some other such situationship 
and became parents to myself and my three siblings. They sent us to schools where teachers wore afros and dashikis, taught us new songs and poetry about who we were and could be. They were reshaping our world, expanding it beyond Demopolis, Alabama and Orangeburg, South Carolina. And that's all I knew. I'd never visited my father's side of the family in South Carolina. I was 10 the last time I visited family in Alabama. Only two of my mother's eight siblings stayed. The others went to Chicago, where the murder of the youngest at the age of 16 by Chicago police would render our family speechless. Joe Lee was a hashtag before hashtags were a thing. We were powerless. I see the demon of slavery and racism as the foundational cause of my family's fragile roots. I know that Joe Lee's unthinkable death did us in. We don't talk about any of it. Over time, we outgrew a desire to visit a place that seemed so small in comparison to our life in New York City. Over time, I forgot my connection to that soil. I forgot about that piece of the puzzle. But breathing the air in Alabama those three days were a healing shock to my system. Something of me knows I've been home. At the memorial site for victims of lynching, I stood among and then under the 800 steel monuments which list over 4,000 names. At the entry to the museum, I made my way through the many memorials, standing sometimes face to face with them or shoulder to shoulder with the named truth of so much pain. Visitors walk through and around this labyrinth of steel, right? And all the while you're descending, descending so slowly that you don't realize you've tilted your head back, right? And you're going further and further until what you're looking at appears to be steel tombs. Each is marked by county and then lists the name of the identified victims of racialized terror, the known names of victims of lynching in that particular region. Where was mine? <coughs> I didn't know. I didn't know what county to look for. In a frenzy, I texted my sister and then finally did a search on Google to find Marengo and Orangeburg counties. How did I not know? I was looking up when I realized I was standing near one of the three other African Americans on the trip and he'd found his too. Later we reflect on the feeling of overwhelm, the heartbreak of it all, and that night I went to bed, whispering to myself, I am Leisha, daughter of Mary and Maliki who hail from Marengo and Orangeburg counties. And I just played that over and over in a loop in my head because I was making connections to a truth about me that I didn't even, I didn't claim on a regular basis. For me, it's an, a manageable beginning, just reciting it. But I know now that I need and I want more. Place is important, belonging is important. What happened to us? What happened to my family? That we've essentially divorced ourselves from our southern roots, from this part of our story. I'm in a space of unmooring because of what I don't know and what from every day since continues to unfold. My psyche cannot separate itself from the sense of chaos because the soul feels this ripping. The soul feels that first brutal and wrenching tear that originated first somewhere on the continent of Africa, and then the subsequent but subconscious pulling away from the South, 
the memories and the unknown, even the things I don't know of Alabama and South Carolina. I can't separate it, for it's part of my soul's memory as a descendant of slaves. It's how the rampant illness that is racism has impacted my life, my family, and we're only one story. Dr. King warned of our nation's illness, saying we were morally sick. His diagnosis was rooted in his assessment that America had never fully repented of her original sin of race-based chattel slavery. I'd be remiss in not mentioning it, but it's all been said before. My frustration has me seeking new words, new words and ways of delivering what should be a very simple message. Racism is evil. Residing within and around us, it manifests as human actions, human systems that seek to destroy life. It has robbed us of so much, but I won't let it have me, and we can't let it have us. On this first Sunday of Black History Month, I'll take the time to remind us that our stories, our American story, is being silenced, shelved away as a past we don't want our children to know about, one we don't want to even teach. I recently watched a Republican candidate try to defend the position that America was not designed to be a racist country. Their argument ignored the Constitution's original stance that slaves would be counted as three-fifths of a person. It denied the impact of cessation that led to the Civil War. It denied segregation, Jim Crow, and the many and myriad ways racism has been woven through the fabric of our nation, leaving black Americans significantly behind in every category from wealth, investing, home ownership, education, health. The American plan was for the exclusive benefit of white male landowners, period. At the height of the Black Lives Matter movement, businesses and institutions that wanted to be marked as present on the right side of history, align themselves accordingly with programs to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion. And there were some companies that did this with a faithful heart. I truly believe that. But they took on this task. They were going to take on the work of examining and rooting out what they could of systemic racism. And they made all kinds of promises. Unfortunately, as the real work began, their promises fell flat. It's not that DEI doesn't work. It's that we don't want to do the work. And here's a tidbit from the parenting trenches. Today, white elementary and middle schoolers are using the N-word and jokes about George Floyd to belittle their African-American classmates. This is the pool our children are swimming in. So it's our job to respond to it. Black history, black existence, our history and liberation must be told and taught. It must be celebrated. We need to know about white abolitionists who joined the struggle. Our children need to know so that at an early age, they can begin making choices about who they are, who they want to be, and what kind of world they want to live in. On our bulletin cover is a picture of another of the memorial offerings. Soil was collected from lynching sites to commemorate the lives lost, the irreplaceable dreams, the possibilities, the hopes. Each jar tells a story, but not only of the person who died there. I believe each jar of soil tells our collective story because the soil, the earth, belongs to no one person. It belongs to us all. Co-mingled in each jar are the tears of the victim's loved ones. Right along the jeers, right alongside the jeers and taunts of those who gathered to watch and celebrate. The land holds the story. God help us, we cannot escape each other. 
Aboriginal activist Lila Watson speaks of our liberation as being bound together and shares that it is only from that acknowledgement that we can begin working toward collective freedom. It's the only way. Our God has something to say about the powers of evil and our ability to confront them, but we aren't hearing it. Jesus has the authority to overcome evil, and he gives it to us. This is part of our great commission. But we need new words to understand this kind of power, a fresh teaching, anointing, or maybe just simple grace to help us believe what God is saying about the call to the front lines of liberation and our ability to not only handle it, but overcome it. As a nation, we are at a critical juncture. We need a movement that will shift the narrative, impact policies and elections at every level of government, and build lasting change that benefits us all. Can we do this? How will we do this? What I realized on my pilgrimage is that we take the leap and care for each other along the way because we have to. We absolutely have to. There is no other option. We make ourselves vulnerable and confront the truth head on. We ask the questions. We care for each other by not turning away. I'm convinced there's no way forward without telling, without the telling and communal processing of these stories, without us doing this work. There's no way forward without sitting with the question of why. No way forward without sitting in the discomfort of true solidarity. No way forward without knowing who you are. Something is being asked of us. Something new, something deeper is being illuminated and it is absolutely required. So I'm praying today for new words, new music, art, poetry, movement that will compel us to action toward any and even the smallest things rather than remaining silent. Silence and half-truths will no longer do. This is true for us individually. It is true for our church. It is true for the world. The elders say we've been here before and that we will survive. And I want to believe that. Part of our work is remembering where we've been. So this is the work. This is the hope. And that sounds like God to me. The message of Christ is always one of hope. Jesus silences the demons, says no to evil in our midst, tells us the work must continue and that it is ours to do. Jesus says, let's go. At ground level, the spirit is moving, calling to and empowering us for action. We're in it. This time of hopeful agitation, right? It's moving and changing and growing. And we're in that agitation together. The healing of our world begins with us. We are the ones we've been waiting for, or more simply stated and personally, everyone is waiting for you. Take a deep breath with me. And I will close with words that read like a prayer to me from Alice Walker. Just take on that prayerful stance. At this time of mourning and remembrance, may we be connected to each other May we know the range and depths of feeling in ourselves and in each other. There is vulnerability, fear, love, rage, hatred, compassion, courage, despair, and hope in ourselves, each other and the world. May we know our most authentic feelings and voice them when we speak. 
May we tap into soul and spirit when we are silent together. May healing begin in us. May we form and become a circle. Amen.